Hey, such calming music on that countdown. It's nice and serene. It actually kind of sounds like church music at the end there. <laughs> the organ, that's what it makes organ. me think of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to Wake Up World. How are you guys doing? Good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Right. Happy to be here again. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. We're happy to have you. So you've got Jerusha, our intuitive energy and bodywork expert. And this is Kyle, our uh, mental hygienist, <laughs> uh, yeah. expert in, in uh, mental therapies and credentials in NLP. Yeah. And then Dave we science advisor. Yes, science advisor, and research expert. And then today we've got the honor of having Mark Allen with us. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Mark. Well, thank you. I am excited to be here. Um, tell you about me. I am a lover of arts and creativity. And that has brought me what I feel a, a great way in, in from where I was to where I am now. And I know that there's a long way to go, but the creativity is what gives a spark to my life. I love that and it, it keeps it exciting. Oh, nice. That's, that's, it's nice to have something like a passion, passion in life. The, uh, so well, tell us a little bit, what draws you to art? Well, there, there's quite a few things. I think at the basic level, it's connection and an emotional connection to um to your to yourself and then to others and so whether it's through a painting or a drawing or i particularly love ceramics and sculpture and so through 3d forms of art that's uh, what i love most and the connection that I have and the feelings that I have when I'm doing it or when I'm seeing it or when I am sharing it are what draws me to art. Nice. Nice. Something on that? Okay. So I love that. I love that. So with arts and the world of arts and the world of creativity, um, so but other than art, because I, my mind, not being like in the creative world, I think art and creativity like one in the same. I don't think much outside of when you get into creativity. I think only art, really. So, what are some other avenues or other things other than art that are creative expression? Yeah, it's great, great question. And I think that those identities of creativity being unanimous with art is or music even is such a is such a misnomer it's not really they're not unanimous and creativity is when is when you have a new idea when you think of something differently when you use something that's already existing in a different way when um you fall you solve a problem and that's creativity at its core. So when, when you're driving home from work and there's a car crash and you can, in your mind, think of the back channel way to maneuver around that accident and then get home even quicker, whatever, that, that's creativity. And so in your in in professions and jobs when there's a problem and you can think outside of the box and and find a way to solve that issue that's creativity so um i i think that creativity just has so many more places than than what we give it credit for so in the terms of like creative expression, that would be more um, creativity expressing emotion, would you say? Yeah, I would say that it doesn't necessarily even need to be emotion, but it needs to be that there is some sort of expression or connection. And so when we say, okay, now what's expression? 
Well, it means that there's a meaning behind it. And so I can, I can have something, I can have a purpose. I can say there's a political statement that I want to make. And maybe there's some emotion behind that, but that I'm not in, in essence trying to express emotion. I'm trying to express, a, make a statement. And so that expression of, of, it can also just be ideas of here is a, a new way of thinking, or even just that this is my way of thinking. And if it's not new, then I'm going to put it out there and that you put it out there and you share it, then that's where the expression comes in is that you share a piece of creativity. Hmm. Okay. Can I, uh, can I ask a question? What is it that you do is, is, I mean, your primary understanding of your purpose in, in this life and this existence now as an artist, is it to, <clears throat> is it to teach people art and utilize that as a healing manifestation or through the process of creating art? Or is it you creating art and allowing something to uh, exude through that that creation that you have put in that what you've put into that creation that becomes a healing for people that are observing it, or even uh, something that opens them up and enhances their creativity by by enjoying your artwork or contemplating it? Yeah, it's a great question. And to give a little background, the first place or the first time when I really felt a con when I really felt like art was meaningful was for strictly personal reasons, was because of the way that I felt when I did art. It made me feel something just in the process. And when I got to share that, then it has some other an effect on or can have an effect on somebody else and those effects can be wide ranging i've looked at pieces of art and i've just been so upset and i've thought how could that happen and it just has made me feel not happy but angry and particularly some of those that i recollect are are, are photographs and i think of some of this imagery that how could that happen in the world? And so, um, but to, to get back to your question, what is my purpose in art? And I think that there's, that I couldn't define it or narrow it down to just one. And I really enjoy being able to teach and share and help other people experience what I have through art. And so that's a, a teaching piece. And I really enjoy that. But I also, in the artwork that I create, see that it can have a deeper meaning and impact. And so I try to, to make my art in a way that others can see and can, can either connect with or that they can have, that there's a meaning behind what that piece is. Do you, do you have like a, a studio where you bring students and do you rest i mean do you you you've mentioned we talked offline and you you shared with all of us about uh the, the fact that you you work in all different manner of art so i'm i'm curious as to um well what's a class like with you is it like one-on-one -on -one stuff or do you have groups of people that come to the class uh is it do you um do you for for example do you say, okay, we're going to do a sculpting class and then uh, you get people out with the chisels and the hammers working on alabaster, doing that kind of stuff. What do you do uh, for teaching art? Yeah, there's, it, so as, as what my current practice is, is it's been kind of, it's been limited. And part of that has been due to the pandemic. And um, so we're building some online classes that are focusing on creativity. And our first one is going to come out on Monday, this coming Monday. 
it, it's not focused on any particular medium. It's just focused on the process of creativity. So, um, but my primary medium that I enjoy most and that I'm what I would say is most fluent in is ceramic and, and is clay. So uh, pottery and sculpture and the some of my favorite artwork to make is a thrown vessel that has a carving or distortions mm. that turn what normally would be a functional piece into something that is just purely aesthetic and so that's one of the things that i love to I, i'm laughing because you were talking about a thrown pot and i uh i once upon a time took a class took a, a pottery class at, at, at byu and I was like the only guy that was incapable of throwing a pot. I mean, <laughs> a, an entire, you know, half a semester and just a big, you know, I think I got, I ended up with a C in the class, my only C, but I, I got it because I was just not capable of stabilizing clay and drawing it up like that. So I was constantly throwing clay off and hitting the people next to me and sticking it on the wall and other things. So I, I had to laugh because I haven't probably thought of that for nearly 40 years now. And uh, you're talking about throwing pots and it just instantly the image came back to my mind. How, how crappy I felt that I was, you know, the one person in a class of, you know, 25 that was incapable of, you know, mastering that. And because I just thought it would be so easy to do and therefore... Easy. So anyway, it's uh, my point, I guess, is that, you know, it's one must be careful about what they choose in order to, you know, manifest their creativity or develop it, because I certainly didn't feel very creative after after all of that experience. Uh, yeah, it's funny that you say that I my in my first ceramics class, the first project was a hand building was a hand building piece. and after the first project my teacher pulled me aside and he said you know i think you have an eye for this and a little while later cool. he's like you know you you could be he, he he really tried to train up his students and he took a lot of pride in them and so he yeah. was like you know you could be and he also loved competition uh, he just had us compete against yeah. each other and he's like you could be the best hand builder i've ever had and this is after I threw my first my first piece on the wheel or tried. And he's like, but I don't think you should spend your time on the potter's wheel because you're just not going to get it. <laughs> That's and funny. And I just, story. just said to him, his name's Kyle Guyman. And I just said to him, I said, you are so wrong. I'm going to be the best hand builder and the best wheel thrower you've ever had. And so now we laugh about that. And, um, and I, I, I don't know that I'm actually the best hand builder he's ever had, but I still think I'm the best wheel thrower he's ever had. So <laughs> by hand building, is that the rolling it up and then rolling it up into like snake and spiraling it around and then smoothing it from there? Is that oh, what you yeah, mean by hand building? Yeah, hand building has that. There's a class of other types, but yeah, that that mm. would be a coil pot that you were describing. And then there's pinch pots and slab pots, and those are or other types of sculpture made of that. And so all sorts of things that you can do in hand building. Um, but yeah, so it's it's kind of the if it's not mm. thrown on the wheel, then you're doing another form of of hand building or some other type of sculpture. So that's amazing. I, I think that it's a, an, a really powerful thing that at a young impressionable in developmental age that you had, uh, you had somebody who stepped in and, uh, and just, you know, gave you the kind of love and support and in a very powerful way as an, as an educator to encourage you to develop did you think that that was at the time did you did you feel like did you feel like yeah i'm that person or did you feel like uh he was it was just a loving kind of a gift uh 
that was being given to you. And then you realized you were going to grow into that, that level. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, like, did you feel like I'm already there and yeah, I'm that person or did, you know, or was that ego absent uh, given where you were coming from or what you talked about in, in your life and in your life's path? And were you, uh, were you in a position where you were humbly accepting that compliment, but using that as a motivator to, to become the best at what, at what you do? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So I think there's a couple parts to the answer. And the first is at that time, I had no idea. I didn't, I didn't want to do art. I didn't think that that was, I didn't think that would be what my life's mission per se would be. I didn't feel like I was an artist. And so part of it was just that I was competitive and I wanted to show them up. And um, the other part was that mentorship that he gave to me helped me and pulled me out of a, a little bit of a rut that I was in. I had, as a child, gone through quite a series of depression of depressive episodes and I would ebb and flow a little bit as, as many people who have battled with that have. Um, and it, art gave me a place to put some of that emotion and to just be okay for a moment of saying, I'm not worried about what else is going on right now. I am completely focused on this piece that I am making right now. And that gave me an escape from what the rest of the world was telling me or what I was telling myself that the rest of the world was telling me. There you go. Yeah. And <clears throat> that opened my eyes to see the world differently. And so that's when the changes in me started to happen. And the mentorship that my teacher gave to me was very incredible and uh, really took me under his wing. He, it, this was in high school and he would prep me. He'd come in on Saturdays to help mentor me and make sure that my stuff was getting ready before a big show and that we were getting it fired on time and um, I was fortunate enough to have a supporting mother who would bring us in uh, sandwiches and soups and all sorts of other stuff so that we could keep going and we'd go all day on a Saturday. And he, of course, never got paid for that, but um, it was a really meaningful experience and we still talk frequently and it's um, been... <clears throat> almost 10, um, not quite 10 years. So was, wow. yeah, that, that's been awesome. That is definitely a, a tale of an extraordinary educator. Uh, and we need to have more like him. So if he ever hears this or, you know, bravo to him because, uh, you know, look what he created in you. So uh, just by encouraging and stuff. I have an, another question and I'll shut up because I know Kyle's got questions. Is, is, no, 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 is that you mentioned the term of waiting until I became an artist. And so what I think, what I'm thinking is wh when does one decide that they have become an artist? Are you not an artist at any point what you're, when you're creating something or attempt to, or just, you know, doing something in, in uh, a medium and working with it? Or is there really a time or a line that's crossed? And is it a spiritual line, a self-awareness line, or is it an academic line uh, that one crosses that says, okay, now I, I'm an artist? Because I'm curious about that because I, I, I'm just curious. Uh, what what deems one an artist? Yeah, I... I <clears throat> Being an artist is a way of identifying. And so it, and it, and it's also a title and you can self, uh, you can self claim that title. You can say I'm an artist. And 
So it, it was for me, it, that came at a point when I felt like that was a piece of who I was. So, and there's many ways that, you know, that we identify as a brother, a husband, a child, as a doctor, as a professor, and those it, those titles or those positions or those things help us or give us an identity. And so I would say that that you, anybody can be an artist and anybody can claim that title and they don't have, you don't have to go to school. You don't have to have a degree to, to claim the title of being an artist you just have to feel like that's a piece of who you are. And, you know, you don't have to say that you're a full-time artist and still not be an artist. You can be whatever else you are and still be an artist. And if you don't think that you are an artist, I still think that you, that anybody and everybody can claim the title of being creative and it takes it can take some effort to really see that and believe that but i think as we talked about before there's a if we can dissociate being creative from art specifically then more people will be in tuned to say okay i can be creative and there's other spheres where i can be creative and i don't have to just draw even though i may not like drawing that doesn't mean that I won't be creative or that I won't be an artist. So, for example, 2D artwork is is hard for me. I don't see in a 2D way. I see in th <clears throat> three dimensions. And so when I have done jewelry or stained glass or some other or glass blowing, I've, I've had a uh, gratefully had some experience to do that or even woodworking and I haven't had a ton of experience in these other mediums but I've always connected and seen myself a little bit more in those as opposed to when I've tried to draw or paint or do charcoals or whatever the 2d medium is can, can I share an, another thing you got you guys oh yeah um, yeah. <clears throat> because yeah. I'm I'm uh, intrigued by uh, by what Mark's sharing with everyone here, and I, you know, you were saying that uh, uh, you don't like working in a two two dimensional medium, and I I get it because one of the things that I did, some people know, it, it's a as a remote viewer is uh, working with my mind and being able to perceive something. Uh, from a non-physical perspective, and then to be able to distill that down into a into what's considered a four-dimensional lexicon, and uh, and then objectify it two-dimensionally on a piece of paper, and there's a tremendous amount of human of filtration that goes on there in doing something like that. So you're ob you're you objectifying the fact that that's difficult for you makes perfect sense. Uh, it's a real it's a real bummer and people have that become really good at working in two dimensional medium uh, are individuals that through the connection with the two dimensional are actually uh, kind of working in a kind of a transfused state where they are trying to, to lessen the filtration between what they are perceiving and what they're manifesting or creating on the paper. Mm -hmm. And that, becomes ultimately the really true mark of a, a highly creative uh, in artist that's doing that. And then there's even another layer of it that we now know that there's a subconscious imprint that become that is actually identifiable in an artist's work that works in two dimensional medium. I don't know so much that it would be in uh, three or four dimensional. And I think it what you're really working in is, Four dimensions. I mean, your hands are on something three dimensionally, but you're actually there's an element of time scientifically that's being applied to what you're doing as well and how you're doing it. And over time, you're making this creation. So you're really working in four dimensions. But back to what I was saying is that people 
make these things that become a manifestation into the texture and into the creation that they do in paint. And then there are people that can actually stand back and look at what the person has created. And they find all of this kind of like a story inside a story. Uh, so you've got the story of the painting, shall we say, whether it's oil or pastel, I don't know, acrylic, whatever. But there are, there are things that are actually subconsciously, unconsciously put into the painting through brush strokes and use of color and all kinds of other things that happen that they theorize, right? In the science of this, they theorize that uh, the human through the creative perceptive process, when they're, when they're seeing something, right? Uh, they're seeing it in its perfect state, no matter where it might be. And then they're trying to, with their biological brain, they're trying to translate that into four-dimensional understanding. And then they're trying to create that eight-dimensional perception in two dimensions. So what ends up happening is they end up actually subconsciously including other elements of what they have perceived out there into the painting. And I, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen a, the, a female artist friend that did, worked in acrylic and her work was amazing. And you could always look at it, one of her paintings and then see uh, a manifestation of some other aspect of the painting that even she did not know was there. So again, that's a, there's a, there are many theories about what goes on there just in uh, the human uh, biochemical ability to creatively perceive something uh, in the non-physical and then create it in the, in the physical and how much of the non-physical actually gets pushed into the painting. Anyway, so I just, it would be tougher to do in sculpting, but not really in the type of sculpting you're doing. Uh, because I think that, you know, you would, you would truly through your, through your hands, uh, create different layers of things in your work. I, I submit, I don't really know. So it, it's interesting to ponder that anyway. Yeah, I love that. I think that's really interesting. And to be able to say the two things that I really liked that I pull out from you is, is the, is, is one is the word perception. <clears throat> and so that the way that we see something isn't always the way that it is. And so when you look at an image, a 2d image, and you see depth in that image, it's a perception. It's not, mm -hmm. that's not reality is it's a flat image, but yet it looks like it has depth. And that's something that I've always been fascinated with in 2D art. And it's something that takes a long time for people to be able to master. And so when we've talked about, you know, how I identify as an artist, I still think that I'm very much on that path of becoming creative, continually becoming an artist. And I don't, and so I guess the, the second um, piece that I liked that I'm pulling out from what you're saying is that somebody can look at something and have a different experience with it and their experiences or whatever you, whatever ideology you prescribe to, to think on how people come to the way that they think is going to influence what they see in that image and so you've you've i'm sure you've seen or you probably have seen these images where they've put these dual or these hidden things in it where you'll see somebody will see mm -hmm. a picture and a picture of water and the other person will see a rabbit and somebody will see a woman mm -hmm. and somebody else in that same picture will see two people kissing and there's some of those where they'll mash these images where if you look a certain way, you see one thing. If you look another way, you see something completely different. And then, and, and so that just goes to show that there is, 
something of what are you thinking? What experiences are you bringing to the table that influence the way that you see that you interact with the piece? And so, and, and I would say that that is different from expression is there's what the artist is doing in expressing what they're feeling or what they are thinking. And then the reception of how that is received is, can be completely different. Mm -hmm. It's, it's interesting as we're, as we're talking and going through my mind, cause I kind of just had a light bulb moment in thinking creativity and art and realizing, I mean, just us talking and trying to mold words together and express them into the English language and making connections in, in the conversation that we're having right now is a form of creativity, especially as we're painting a picture in our head. And earlier, um, when, when David had a memory come to mind of him trying to do clay work and on, on the will and it going all over, I mean, that would be a form of creativity as he re brought that memory back in and it painted a picture in his head and, and then making all those connections. So I'm kind of just like, oh my gosh, whole new, whole new like outlook on art and creativity for myself. Yeah, and, and him expressing that and then painting the picture in our minds is what I saw in my mind was him sitting down in, I've been to a, a, the BYU ceramics studio. I've taken, I took classes there. And so that's exactly where I picture Dave. And so I see that. But for somebody else who says, oh, I actually haven't ever been there or I've never been in a ceramic studio is they're going to see something in their mind that's completely different. And so there's there's David who is creating the who is taking what the images in his mind, creating a way of of words to be able to paint the picture in our minds and we'll receive it based on what our experiences or what or our past that we will 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 perceive that differently yeah our own perception our own filter will play a part in that that's perfect example of that that's awesome yeah and and fortunately we're all constantly perceiving and re-perceiving and redefining and we're doing it at the speed of thought which is actually uh proven to be faster than the speed of light. And so you can look at Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher's uh, uh, explanations and studies, peer reviewed studies on that. Uh, our mind moves at such amazing speed and throughout the process, it's never just making an interpretation of something and holding it there. It just doesn't. And that's uh, the only time that uh, uh, an image or a perception of something, whether it's an event in our life or whether it's a, it's a piece of art, the only time that that's ever really held, uh, it's, it's held for uh, really an infinitesimal, unmeasurable uh, amount of time. And that's really critical for everyone to grasp that notion is that it, it's never, in our perception of something whether in the physical or the non-physical, whether in the past or something we're trying to imagine in the future, that it never is held in a moment. It never stops. It is defined perfectly that uh, we're talking about the moment that we're perceiving something, right? And the moment is something that we know is change and time approaching zero, yet never getting to zero and approach change and time approaching the infinite and yet never reaching the infinite. And so both of those sub equations combined as a total define the moment for us. It means that it is always moving. And so uh, when you start to under look at it from that perspective, you understand why our minds are, cal are calculating and processing, cognating it faster than the speed of light. They have to be because they're never going to be able to stop as they perceive in this life. Um, do you see a practical application uh, beyond what you've talked about so far with, with, uh, with art? And are you, again, are you talking about uh, just general, generally encouraging people 
to engage in art, to enhance your creativity. Oh, you, you did say you're creating courses, but do you think that that would be for something for like people suffering from PTSD or people with uh, addiction issues or people with uh, depression issues and stuff like that? Are there applications that you're going to be going after with your cor online courses that go that deep into the process? Absolutely. And part of it will come with, with time as we build and develop. And, but that's not to say that there's not things that anybody can do at any time. And it's not to say that there's not other avenues for finding <clears throat> uh, help through art. There's art therapy is, um, is is growing and the practice of art therapy is growing and i've had you know a couple of friends who have had really meaningful experiences as they've gone to art therapists and um when you mention ptsd there there are a few the struggle with art therapy is not it's less covered by insurance as opposed to typical psychotherapy or talk therapy. And so um, you just have to, and, and not to say that that's a hindrance, but there are for veterans or for PTSD or for young children, many more people who are seeking help through insurance will find art therapy to be approved. Now, that's um, just more of a side note than anything. The point of what I'm trying to say is that there is a lot of avenues for people who are who can make or would like to have a difference made for them through art. And one of the most accessible forms is, is YouTube videos and starting with art. And what our courses are going to be designed towards is creativity initially and will expand from there. So what that looks like is one is one of our our first class is going to be revolving around a crayon. And what does a crayon do and how can you use a crayon and how can you challenge the way that a crayon is used? Um, and then we'll have some exercises around how to be creative with a crayon. And so part of the reason for choosing that is you're choosing something that is accessible to anybody, that uh, a common household object for almost all households is a crayon. So you don't need anything special for that. Now, where this applies to other people who have who are looking to find some resolutions to their lives and make some changes in their lives is that the first step is, or the first, the first step in the process that I would say is that expressing or being in tune with creativity helps you connect to your own emotions and mm. can help you understand them. And so no matter what you're doing, if you have somebody who's guiding you through that or not, is that as you start to engage in a creative practice that you will be able to connect with your own emotions more fully. And when you express them, there's a release that comes with that. There's an aspect of, of healing that can come with that. And so the, the first general counsel is to engage in creativity and to find if you say, yeah, there's so many people who say, you know, I'm just not creative. And part of the reason for that is they tie that to what they see as art. And so they'll see something like <clears throat> a drawing and they're like, ah, I've never, I've never been good at drawing, so I'm not creative. And, um, but there's something that is for everybody and you'll be able to find that. And some of it just takes exploration where, you know, for a long time until I was 16, I always was like, no, I'm not creative. And I mean, to be a doctor. And then, you know, just have some experiences where your mind changes. And so 
start engaging and test it out and start exploring creative avenues that you might be interested in. This kind of makes me think of um, when you were saying about um, how how putting the, the drawing is like putting the emotion on the paper and there's there's like a release from that. Um, just makes me think of a lot of exercises um, I've heard of, of writing things down, like the, the journaling um, sort of thing, how it kind of provides the same thing. But then you get the whole um, picture paints a thousand words. So would you say maybe in your opinion that that um, like doing a simple doodle could could be more of a, a powerful emotional release than just writing about what you're feeling? I wouldn't necessarily say that one is more powerful than the other. I think a lot of that is just personal journey and per and it can be personal preference even. And there's writers and authors and other people who that is so powerful for them. And the other, the thing that I would say of you saying this is powerful when you write it down and you write a thought down and it has mm -hmm. more power or you draw something and it has more power. And one of the reasons for that is because it connects mind and body. And so when you can put those in tune and you can focus your mind, body, and I would even say your spirit, then into one, into one channel then you can find harmony. And so I think that's a value that comes from using uh, whatever that form is of expressing, of expression, even if you hold it to yourself, you putting it on paper, if you don't show anybody, you still have transferred that from your mind to a piece of paper. And that's a form of expression. So what form of process or journey would you recommend for somebody that maybe has tried in the past and they're in their mind, they're, they're not good, they're not creative. And say you were to, you know, they're listening tonight. What kind of journey would you say, hey, try this. And then if that's not working, then try this and, and kind of guide yourself through, like what, what kind of guidance would you give to somebody like that? Yeah, the first, the first step that I would say is to think upon your past and to say, and to just look at seeing, are there things that you've tried and are there things that you haven't tried that you would like to? And there's a lot of times where people will say, oh, I've, I've heard this. Oh, I'd love to take a ceramics class, but I never have. And so my question is, is why not? Has it, has it been because you've never found one, because it's never been readily available, because it costs too much? What is it that is your barrier? So if there's something that, uh, so initially, if there's something that you're drawn to, find a way to break the barriers to get to that, to try it. And so that was what my experience with ceramics was, was, I'd always thought, you know, that could be fun, but I'd never tried it until, and I never thought that I was creative. And then I tried mm -hmm. it. And so there's a bit of exploration. So I would say, think about what it is that you're drawn to, if there's a particular medium, and then find a way to get there. And whatever those barriers are that are in your way, there can be a way to break them or to work around them. And um, so that would be what my initial advice would be. And hopefully we'll be able to, to start some of those where we can say, we're gonna start with a crayon. And I'll give one other example of, is if, if the goal is to be creative and you don't have a particular medium, then look around you. And you'll find some that if you, well, one, one I would say is there's a common understanding when I was in art school at, at the University of Utah, where the first day they say, okay, we're starting our projects, but you have to understand that creativity loves constraints. And so give yourself some constraints 
And that could even be, for example, um, you, you're going to say, I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to try something new. I'm going to look at something from a different avenue, from a different point of view. That's a great way to start. Mm -hmm. And so one of the pieces that I did in, in college was a cereal bowl. And you're thinking, okay, you're a potter, so you make cereal bowls. But I made a cereal bowl made out of cereal. And so you can take a household object, like you have cereal and a hot glue gun, and you can turn it into a sculpture that's a cereal bowl. And that is not functional whatsoever, but <laughs> it's, 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 and, and for me, there was some meaning behind that on why I chose to do that. And so take your creativity and, um, and, and you can give yourself a constraint, a rule to follow that mm. helps you really become or, or experiment with a little bit of creativity. Okay. So uh, would you, would you say, or is there anything special that somebody would need to do to bridge the gap between creativity and, and making it therapeutic in some way? <clears throat> um, in some way, I believe that creativity is therapeutic no matter what form it takes. And I believe that creativity is healthy for your mind. And the expression part particularly is where I find the benefits. And so... Um, I would say that to bridge that gap before you start to find the benefits is to get involved and so to start trying. And so I, I guess I don't have a, an answer for you besides mm. that. I believe that creative expression is in itself therapeutic and you can do specific things, specific exercises, specific ways of using art that may be more therapeutic than others or that may connect you more fully than others. Um, but in all essences, I believe art or, or creative expression is therapeutic. Okay. One more question for me. And then if anybody else has any questions, I'll, I'll, uh, yeah, I have more questions. Awesome. Um, is there any, warnings you would put to creativity or to art when somebody's getting into that and venturing into that? Um, you know, I would give a warning. And the, the warning that I would, that I needed to give myself when I first started was to not forget to eat. And that, that might not be the same experience that everybody else has. But the, the warning that I actually would give is I would say um, <clears throat> is, is to, to, don't sh to not shut it down prematurely. Mm, okay. so acknowledge that you have, that, that likely you'll come to the table with barriers, with mental barriers that are going to, hinder you from fully experiencing what you could have you, if you give it a, a, a fair chance. I like that. All right, Dave. Yeah. Well, I just, I have some, uh, some, um, observations on, on this that, uh, I know that, uh, I really like your message talking about the power and the importance of creativity and, uh, and recognizing, as we all have in this uh, presentation, that there are all manners of mechanisms in ways in which we can begin to express our creativity. And, and then we have discussed the importance of expressing one's creativity just for an enhancement to one's well-being, their sense of balance and, and you know, centeredness, uh, grounding, et cetera. Uh, I mean, there's very few, if if there are any 
uh, negatives that you could apply to it, I don't, I don't know what they would be. <clears throat> so whether it's creative writing or sketching, or whether it is even engaging in debate or, you know, other things, these are all expressions of creativity and exercises of it. And I, I get that, that that is your message. Uh, for people, I'm not an artist, but I clearly I have tried to dabble in art. So I can tell you that I I know that it's you have to look because I know the que the question was being asked of how do you do this or how do you get started or what should you get started in and I can add my two cents to that is that uh, you know you start looking at making the decision just as Mark suggested which is to decide what it is you think you want to do and. Uh, I'll tell my story that once upon a time, I, after I was having my, you know, I had have had 12 spine surgeries and they've all been quite severe and I, it makes me sit weird and I can't turn my head. Anyway, when that first started happening and I came to the realization that I was no longer going to be the man that I used to be <clears throat> in any way, shape or form, uh, it stopped me from being able to do more things than I care to talk about. But I just couldn't anymore because I was I was being stitched together and held together by an erector set. So I was really depressed about it as, as you know about that whole idea and I uh, didn't really know what to do and some I for some stupid reason uh, just in my head uh, I had always marveled at sculpture was one of my favorite things to look at and marvel at like going, you know, to the Louvre in, in Paris, uh, sculpture is what always captured my interest and my fascination about how somebody could manifest something like that out of, out of stone, you know. And so I just picked up the phone. I, I mean, I'd looked online and I just searched for sculpting teachers. <clears throat> and then I, I made, picked up the phone and called a bunch of sculpting teachers in lot here, here in Las Vegas. And I got one that that kind of resonated with me, and uh, and it was a, it's affordable, especially if you have a, most sculpting teachers, uh, even privately, they have the tools that you need, and so you get to use the tools when you come to the class. You don't have to make some big investment of fifteen hundred dollars worth of stuff, right, to do it. Uh, you just show up. You have to buy the rock. You know, and it goes by the pound and it depends on, you know, what kind of stone it is. But typically it's alabaster and it's affordable somewhat. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in one day, the first day, the first hour, you're standing in there with chisels, you know, and hammer hacking away at this stone. And the thing that happened to me in the doing of it that just, I wanted to share with you because it validates what you're saying to people here, is that uh, I went there because my, my surgeon said, you need to do something to get out of your head because you're feeling sorry for yourself and you're depressing yourself, which is retarding your recovery and you're healing because you know, you're walking around uh, kicking cans. And so I actually went to this sculpting class with that intention of I've got to get out of my head and I need to get outside myself and start doing something that engages me and begins healing me. And I, that healed me was being there with this, with this, uh, uh, her name is Sharon Gainsburg as a sculptor, a famous sculptor, uh, here in the Las Vegas area. And, I just learned from her and I, I mean, I didn't do anything good, but that was the beauty of her in just putting a chisel and a hammer into people's hands. Any student that walked in there first day, first minute, you were going to get a stone and start working on it. And I learned that if I tried to impress my will upon the stone, if I tried to make it something that, uh, it was like most things in life. If I tried to force it, to bend it to my will, uh, I ended up not getting where I wanted to get in the project. And she would say simple things like masterful masters do, right? 
that you need to let the stone talk to you and tell you what it wants, you know, what it wants you to be or what it wants to be. And it may not be what you want it to be, but it might be something, you know, similar kind of thing. So I, that's what the approach that we took. And I'm telling you that there was absolutely a therapeutic uh, value to that, that, that completely changed my mindset and my state. And I, you know, I'm not still not good and probably won't be, but I, I still love doing it. And I just love getting dusty and dirty and working with the stone and, and doing, seeing what I can create from it. And so that was really my only journey into art because I never did it in high school. I failed at it at, in the university, which I shared with you. Uh, but always, you know, through my life in doing all the things that I did, there was always this, this, this un, recognized spark that was in me, which I think is in everyone, which is this creative spark, right? This creative desire to do something, to, to manifest something, to create something that uh, you can show to the world, however humble or magnificent it may be and say, look, there's me, you know, I, I did this. And that was how I did it. So I, I really appreciate, um, the courage that you should have shown and the story that you told and the recognition uh, that you made and brought to people uh, to share this idea of creativity being a healing uh, spirit and a healing energy. Thank you. And, and it, I love what you said there. And I love that you had that experience where you were able to have a connection and some sort of experience with the with art and that experience that healing experience is meaningful and there would be one other warning that i would give in that is is judgment is it's so easy to look at what you've made and then compare it to somebody else and judge your artwork and judge yourself. And so whatever, whatever that is, that healing can take place. But as you experience that, not as, um, not from the lens of what you think other people are thinking about your work, but what you're thinking about your work and what your experience with your work is. Yeah, I really, I really dig your. Uh, I, li I like your words and I and I like your energy. So, thank you. Very cool. Um. So, well, for one, for those that have just jumped on, we're we're wrapping up here. We're here with Mark Allen talking about creative expression, and man, his story is great. So uh, rewind and watch some of this stuff. It's pretty good. It's pretty uh, mind mind opening. Um, so before before we end, Mark, is there anything that you'd like to to leave off or add? You know, I I just want to add and just make one last uh, case for finding what it is that you like that you would like if you already know what you like doing to get back to it if it's been a while and to experience art once again. And if you have not experienced it, then to look for something to have that experience. And if you are currently experiencing it, then to share that experience with somebody else. I like that. I like that. Thank you. And thank you personally. I, I've been um, working on getting my comics to like publishing level lately and it's been a little discouraging because i have done a lot of the uh comparing my style to others so i appreciate what you guys have uh brought to my attention about you know just going with um what what the the paper is trying to get me <laughs> to try it as and not what i think it should be because that'll help me get it out there a lot easier i appreciate that I, I mean, I think I would say to you as your friend and partner in all of this is that, you know, the world needs what you have to offer it. And you just yeah. need to remember that. And no matter what you offer, there will always be those who 
you know, who criticize, but there will also be those who love and appreciate and are transformed because of what you produce, right? And that is the audience that you're after. The others, they are unfortunately, you know, the chaff of life and you have no responsibility for them, you know? Well, They'll find it. their solace somewhere else and something else. Thank you. I, you can be a champion with what you do to all of us. Appreciate that. Yeah, I have, I have um, I, I'm excited to get it out there, and um, I like what you said because that that helps me realize as well. Like, I think this is important for everybody that's, you know, working on art or just getting started. Um, is, I mean, we do put a lot of like a lot of criticism into, uh, you know, what we're working on and what we're putting in. And I think that's really self-reflective of the criticism that we give ourselves. And maybe maybe art can be a medium for us to um, be less critical of ourselves and mm -hmm. less critical of what we put out there because here's this physical thing that's a re representation of yourself, your inner thoughts, your inner feelings and works, like everything you guys have mentioned tonight. Um, and, if, and if we're too critical of that, that's got to be a crit being too critical of ourselves and i think that's where a lot of artists succeed is they they stop being so critical of themselves they appreciate what they've made they appreciate who they are inside um and so I, that's that's a great um thought and perspective i'm definitely going to be putting with with my uh, creative expression from now on so thank you for making that I want to add one more thing that just popped into my head about what Mark was. We were talking about when you become an artist and I would, I want to sub toss this out there. I think that you become an artist when you stop taking, uh, when you stop taking direction in your art based on the criticism of others. Okay. That's when you become an artist because as long as you continue to allow critique and criticism to drive what you produce or what you're creating, I think then you are still in this constructive stage of learning or being a student. And I think that the student transitions from student to, to artist, to master, if you will, once they stop requiring that kind of critique and evaluation and feedback in order to you know, to put forward what they produce, right? That's that's what I think anyway. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I like that you said that this is, that if you require that, like when you stop requiring somebody right. to give you critique or feedback, and because we can be an artist and still appreciate somebody else's critique and feedback on what we've done and we'll become a master you can take it or leave it right but yeah. you're not yeah exactly but you just because they say something doesn't mean that that's the truth and and you can be okay with that and yeah. Jerusha, with what you said is when you are less critical of yourself it gives you space and it gives you the room mentally to explore and to find your style and then and and so those those it, and it's going to help you it helps it helps you and you is in a general sense it helps when you're exploring this it helps you to 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 really become unique or to become to define what it makes you the artist and what your style is so thank you yeah i'm excited to go about it in this new light so Yes. Well, we're going to be wrapping it up here. Anybody that has any questions at all, you can throw it in the comments. We'll make sure that we reach out and answer those questions, as well as if you're curious about the courses that Mark's putting on or the classes. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. The future work that he's doing, reach out any of us. We will, we will get the answers to you um, and the details to you. Those are all still being worked out and they're still in their very young stages, but we will get that information to you and, and make sure that uh, that's widely known. It will also be on our page um, and we will we'll push that out as much as possible. So, yeah. But uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you, Mark, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, 